right, good morning. <laughs> so we're back with Harry Hi. Potter. I'm looking at Emily Mastillo, who's remote learning, and said that I should wear a Gryffindor scarf for this part two um, in support of Harry Potter. And if you don't know what Gryffindor is yet, we're gonna find out eventually in this story. So we hoped you liked um, some of Emily's artwork that was included in the, uh, in the last one and definitely her video editing. All right, so we're gonna move on to chapter two, The Vanishing Glass. And we're not gonna keep doing character stuff. We're gonna talk about some different things, but um, I think we need to do one more very important character. Um, and we'll see how it goes when we get to it. All right, chapter two is called The Vanishing Glass. Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose on the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursley's front door. It crept into the living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. 10 years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different color bonnets, but Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby. And now the photograph showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up, get up now. Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. So one of the things I noticed in this story is that there are a lot of words I come across that even I'm not familiar with because the author is from another place. She's from London. And so some of the language she uses is a little bit different than what we use here. Um, but just even reading that, the word shrill, which is a word I'm familiar with, but um, his Aunt Petunia was awake and it was her shrill voice that made the noise of the first day. Up, oh, get up now. Harry woke, woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. So I know that shrill voice because she's kind of urging him to get up and he's surprised in waking up and she's banging on his door. So I can imagine that a shrill voice is not really pleasing. Yeah, I don't think I'd wanna wake up to a, a shrill voice. Emily says no either. One day she'll join us. All right. <laughs> up, she screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen and then the sound of a frying pan being put on the stove he rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he'd been having. It was a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling that he'd had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet, she demanded. Nearly, Harry said. Well, get a move on it. I want you to look after the bacon and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect for Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry slowly got out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them and that's where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down to the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all of Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Unless, of course, it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but often he couldn't catch him. He didn't look like it but Harry was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because he always had to wear 
old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobbly knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times Dudley had punched him in the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a lightning bolt. He had it as long as he could remember. And the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he got it. In the car crash when your parents died, she said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. That was the rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked by way of a morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. All right, so we have a lot there about Harry going back a little bit further, So, but we do want to visit that or revisit that, right? What does Harry look like? Because Harry's going to be our main character in addition to the other characters that you already took a, a look at, right? So right now we're not talking about character feelings or character. I think we are learning a lot about our characters um, through their actions, but right now we're just looking at physical appearance, right? We're just trying to do some drawing based on the clues that the author's giving us and what she's saying. Um, so the last piece for Harry um, is this kind of messy hair that grows all over the place, along with his thin face, his knobby knees, his black hair, his bright green eyes, round glasses with scotch tape. Those are all parts of Harry's appearance and not least important, this scar that he has on his head in the shape of a lightning bolt. All right, let's get back to the story. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plates of eggs and bacon on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. 36, he looked up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you've counted wrong. You haven't counted Aunt Marge's presents. See, it's right here. It's under this big one from mommy and daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as he possibly could in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger too because she said quickly, and we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkin? Two more presents, is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like it was hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39, sweetum, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then, Uncle Vernon chuckled. I think parcel is gonna be one of those words that we look at later on. Little Tyke wants his money's worth just like his father. Attaboy, Dudley, he ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote controlled airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. A VCR <laughs> is something that you, you might have to ask your parents to, to let you know what that is. Um, wow, Harry Potter will make, make you feel old. Um, he was ripping off the paper uh, of a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Mrs. Figg's broken her leg. She can't take him. 
She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, to hamburger restaurants, to the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she'd ever owned. Now what, said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he was reminded that it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbets and Snowy, Mr. Paws and Tufty again. And if you hear noises in the background, it is not Tibbet, Snowy, or Mr. Paws. It's Odin. There, I'm in a way. Oh, there he is. That's Odin. He's adorable. He's gonna make a surprise appearance later. All right, we had to move because Odin wanted to join us. He loves Harry Potter. He's a big Harry Potter fan. Okay. We could phone Aunt Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. What about, what's her name, your friend, Yvonne? On vacation in Mallorca, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry said, hopefully. He'd be able to watch TV and watch anything he wanted on television for a change, maybe even have a go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she just swallowed a lemon. Can you do that? Can you make a face like you just swallowed a lemon? All right. And come back to find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting alone in it. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he'd really cried, but he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky Duddyums, don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I, I don't want him to come, Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin through the gap in his mother's arms. Just then the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Pierce Polkis, walked in with his mother. Pierce was a scrawny, a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry couldn't believe his luck. He was sitting in the back of the Dursley's cars with Pierce and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy, any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in the cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly, but Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys that he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barbers, looking as though he hadn't been there at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short that he was almost bald, except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible scar. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining at school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses, 
that he'd just be laughed at more. Next morning, however, when he woke up, he found his hair exactly as it had been before. He had been given a week in the cupboard for this, even though he tried to explain that he couldn't explain how his hair grew back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puff balls. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but it certainly wouldn't fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd gotten in terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual, as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else. There he was, sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them that Harry had been climbing the school buildings. But all he tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind a big pile of trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him mid-jump. So right now, I'm wondering about all these things happening to Harry. So Aunt Petunia and Uncle Dursley and Dudley and some of the boys aren't being so nice to, to Harry, but he seems to be getting some sort of magical help. And that's what I'm thinking about. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to be spending a day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Figg's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said, as a motorcycle overtook him. I had a dream about a motorcycle, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face like a gigantic beat with a mustache. That's a pretty good image to draw, a giant beat with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly. Dudley and Pierce snickered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream. But he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated more than asking questions, it was talking about anything or acting in a way that it, sh or anything acting in a way that it shouldn't. No matter if it was a dream or even a cartoon, they seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance. And then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratching his head, who looked remarkably like Dudley, except that the gorilla wasn't blonde. Otherwise, it looked exactly like Dudley. Harry had the best morning he'd had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little far apart from the Dursleys so that Dudley and Pierce, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back to their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top, Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterward that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they were in the reptile house. It was cool and dark. It had lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering all over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see the huge poisonous cobras and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped his body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a trash can. But at the moment, it didn't look like it was in the mood. 
In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood there with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined to his father. Uncle Vernon tapped the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except for stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard for a bedroom where the only visitors were Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to go visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were on level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and he winked too. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyway, Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail along a little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. Boa Constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? The Boa Constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign once again, and Harry read on. The specimen was bred in the zoo. Oh, I see, said Harry. So you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mrs. Dursley, come, come and look at the snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast that no one saw how it happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning in right up close to the glass and the next they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass in the front of the Boer Constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for their lives through the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong, sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten off his leg while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was that Pierce calmed down enough to say Harry was talking to it weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited till Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry that he could hardly speak. He managed to say, go, cupboard, stay, no meals. Before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run to get him a large brandy. Harry lay in the dark cupboard much later, wishing he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was, and he couldn't be sure that the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't re risk sneaking into the kitchen for some food. He lived with the Dursleys almost 10 years, 10 miserable years, as long as he could remember, 
ever since he'd been a baby and his parents died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes when he strained his memory during long hours in the cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain in his forehead. This he supposed was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them. And of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There were no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it never happened. The Dursleys were his only family, yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were too. A tiny man in a violet top hat had bowed to him once while he was shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them off to and out of the shop without buying anything. A wild looking old woman dressed in all green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand on the street the other day and then walked by without a word. The weirdest thing of all was these people, they always seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy clothes and his broken glasses. And nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. All right, so that's the end of chapter two. Um, so we're gonna, Emily's gonna add some things to think about at the end of this reading. Of course, we hope you have a picture in your head of what Harry looks like now with all his families. You have some ideas about what Harry's going through and some, some strange things that are happening around Harry that we're gonna learn more about. And tomorrow, chapter three, the letters from no one. All right, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Yeah.